change in his career after wow. several years as a teacher and uh, started from scratch and and uh, and studied for an MA and then a PhD in speech and hearing therapy wow which was kind of a new uh, profession in Israel at the time uh, was not uh, uh, existing and uh, ended up uh, staying instead of three years uh, ten years uh, during which I was born oh. Wow. So I think from a very early age, I, I, I absorbed that kind of reality that if you want to do something different and change your life or change something in general, so just change it. And uh, I think it's a deep influence and, and, and I have great appreciation uh, That's to wonderful. my father for, for, and my parents for teaching me that, that, that uh, way of being, which... Uh, which is a struggle uh, that I know from my own self and from many people uh, to, to change your own reality or to change a reality if you see something that you think should be different uh, to act and not just uh, think about it or complain about it. So it's this uh, not only having good ideas but actually executing them, uh, which I think is, the, is the, probably the most important skill that an entrepreneur should have. Uh, taking ideas and deciding to make them uh, happen and, and, and be the change or, or create that change. I think it's beautiful, I meaning from the first years you learned that you have, if you have a dream, please pursue it. And more than that, don't just, you know, mumble about the problems in the world, and, uh, but f try and find solutions and, and act upon these ideas and yeah, bring them to life. I think, I think it's a beautiful story. <laughs> Thank you. So... Uh, Great inspiration, great inspiration. To follow up on that, uh, my personal journey, I, and it's interesting because I have uh, five uh, great and beautiful kids, and it's interesting to see how each one has their own uh, ideas and path and, and passions, but uh, for me as a father to absorb uh, the different passions that in my own family, same DNA, uh, my kids have it's interesting because uh, and also uh, having that notion that sometimes you just don't know what your passion is mm. or you may know what your passion is but you don't know how to turn it into a career wow. uh, because everyone knows that the best thing is to work in something that you see as as having fun and uh, the byproduct that you can also uh, sustain your 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 financial needs uh, for me, it took uh, quite a significant journey to find that sweet spot. Uh, uh, not knowing what I want to do, I, I entered law school uh, in the early 90s, uh, and I chose that knowing that I don't really know what it means to be a lawyer and mm. knowing that I probably do not want to be a lawyer because <laughs> I didn't know enough to say I want to be. But it seemed to me the widest... Uh, a field of studies which leads to some profession which ha it will enable me many a variety of choices in the future so it was kind of not needing to take the decision now but opening the the, the range of opportunities that this uh, profession may may bring uh, I did know that I wanted to do something uh, in the social sciences uh, if it's a science uh, or and and not be uh, at those days, and it's interesting when we follow my story, I didn't want to be in the fields of developing technology as my high school uh, focus and major was in computers and electronics. Mm. I realized okay. how amazing technology is, but I could not see myself as one who his professional life is sitting and writing code or okay. or developing software or, or electronic design. And, and I knew from at least a, the, my high school experience what it is and so I knew what I don't want to be hmm. uh, but you had you have an understanding of this but I, uh, I had deep understanding of, of technology okay. and how as a user technology can change uh, your own reality and and, and hmm. is the future of, of how this uh, world will look like so I knew what I don't want I didn't know what I do want and that's how I began my journey which uh, went to all kinds of interesting places. When I graduated law school, I, I wanted to take a year off and think uh, what I really want to do before I actually enter. I knew that if I enter the field, the chances of leaving something are, are more difficult. So mm. I took a year 
and uh, maybe also following uh, <laughs> the footsteps of my parents, uh, my then wife and I decided to uh, be again sent, uh, working for the community. Jewish agency, wow. and we were sent to do. We wanted to work in a in a small community and in in, in a in a country which is very different than in Israel culturally. So we chose to be sent to Nairobi, Kenya. Wow. And very different than Israel that's for sure that's for sure and uh, and we had the opportunity of living uh, a year and a half or so in, in Kenya and doing community work uh, which is a great ex- was a great experience uh, but it gave me the clarity that I want to to be in the field of education mm. uh, which maybe 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 was something I was trying to run away from because my mother is a teacher and my three my only three sisters are all teachers Ooh, so wow. it was kind of the <laughs> destiny of, of my upbringing and my father of course as of I course. shared with you was a teacher so I thought that I should do something different but somehow I I experienced uh, informal education mm. and that during that time and, and I came back to Israel and, and began a master's degree in education mm. and uh, also became a high school teacher but at the same time I also uh, uh, started working as a lawyer I tried to do both uh, I don't want to spend all that st- no, no, uh, too much time on this, <laughs> but in general, I realize that it's too too difficult to do it's, it's demanding. To, to focus yeah. on two things, which each of them uh, demand your focus. So eventually, I, I I ended my two-year teaching career and went back into the field of of law. Uh, during my legal life, uh, what fascinated me was what my clients do if they were doing fascinating things and and I I decided I don't want to be in the world of, of litigation and and uh, and dispute so I was more in the corporate business world and and working with uh, with clients uh, who have uh, owned their own businesses are you willing to tell us a little bit about what you did regarding you know creating a space for mutual uh, discussion regarding religion and different uh, I think uh, religious uh, you know point of view I think you did something very interesting yeah, are you willing yeah, to yeah. talk about that and then we can plunge in and yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, after trying uh, and, and getting involved a bit in the in the hardcore of, of business I've been involved in, in real estate development and I've been involved in the food industry from the restaurant side of it I I uh, you, you are still a partner in uh, yes yes so in, I yeah. ended up uh, again started some legal work with uh, cu- uh, customers of mine who were who were involved in the uh, aroma espresso bar yeah. and ended up uh, yeah. eventually becoming uh, one of the partners for the our membership. listeners who are not familiar aroma is I think the largest uh, food chain uh, food, food beverage chain in Israel if I'm not mistaken and also there op- you are also operating overseas am I right correct yes. okay I'm just saying so, <laughs> for the people who don't know yeah but uh, but then this desire to to be involved in something uh, uh, social uh, kept on bugging me and uh, the, the last 10 out of the 20 career years of my <laughs> career as a lawyer I was involved in the world of, of, of NGO and uh, was involved uh, it was part of founding uh, an organization which uh, became uh, one of the largest volunteer organizations in Israel for managing a uh, crisis uh, oh. by civilians uh, okay. it's called Levchad. you didn't uh, tell me about that come on this is something <laughs> new for me <laughs> and uh, my second and wh- what exactly is this organization doing Levchad, uh, it's a wh- one heart this is the meaning Levchad meaning one heart Levchad, uh, was was uh, founded uh, in order to solve the uh, unmet need of having civilians take an active ro- organized active role in managing uh, crises which have to do with uh, the civil society 
floods, missile attacks, uh, okay. earthquakes. It's a local one or it's international it's, one? It's local. Okay. And uh, we realized at the time, uh, the group of us, that uh, there are many people who want to do something at this time. Then we started digging into it and we found also that the, the best practice developed by, by those who it's their profession is that the first responders should be from the community because they are there already and they have the ability during those uh, first few hours to, to respond first. Uh, until enough uh, professionals arrive, if they can arrive, because usually there would be a shortage and there would probably be uh, challenges of arriving because of the nature of, of these kind of events. So that was my first involvement in this, uh, in this world of NGOs. I was one of the founders, eventually also managed the organization for, for a few years. And May I ask, are you still, are you already 120? I mean, with, <laughs> I mean, oh, you don't sleep. What are the options? Come on, I tell us the truth. The, the main thing is to be <laughs> not satisfied enough and look for the next uh, okay. thing and be happy about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so many achievements in so such a short time. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Really remarkable. So many explorations, I, I would rather Okay. Uh, refer okay. To no, them but as. you did something. It's not you yeah. weren't sitting on the couch on yeah, the yeah. sofa and active just, explorations. Yeah, well yes. but but but, co but contributing very a lot by, by doing it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be modest, but not, you know, uh, you, you, you can be modest, I shouldn't be for you. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can, you know, sing your praises. Yeah. Uh, my next uh, uh, station in, in this uh, career path was to uh, co-direct uh, interfaith uh, organization. Interfaith. Okay. Interfaith, uh, which had the, the agenda of uh, having the beauty of religion shared and creating spaces for people of religion and different religion to, to celebrate the diversity and to use religion as a powerful positive force for people to, to do good and share the wisdom of religions and religion uh, regardless of which religion it is because all religions, all religions that's my personal belief, carry a lot of ancient wisdom yeah. and, and uh, have a huge potential uh, of driving uh, good in the world. And uh, that was uh, another station, which eventually... Uh, can, can I just say, I think it's beautiful that, uh, unfortunately, Israel is usually uh, being known as people who don't have deep respect to to others, and I think this is a, one, a wonderful, you know, example that uh, it's exactly the opposite that we, sh we cherish, that the fact that also communities which are totally different than us, uh, you know, there is, they have a, a beautiful legacy and uh, they can be a source of in inspiration for all of us. And you should look for the mutual and not what is dividing us. I think, I yeah. think, yeah. I, I think I, it's beautiful. I totally agree. And I hope that, uh, that uh, Israel is not labeled as a place of, of uh, disrespect to diversity. Of course, uh, it's <laughs> yeah. a diverse place. So there are many people and yeah. many opinions. But I didn't find myself uh, very special in, in, in from, from being a person uh, who respected uh, others and, and had the tolerance, and, and not only the tolerance, admiration for the fact that there is diversity in the world and, and it can be celebrated. And, and my, my academic journey drew me to Jerusalem. My, my legal degree, my law school, I did in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And, and as someone who was before in New York and then moved with my family back to, to the central part of Israel, I, it became something uh, unique to experience living in a city which uh, has uh, so many types of people from different mm. walks of life and different religions, and of course uh, the holy places for, for, the, for Judaism, Islam, and, and uh, Christianity and realizing that it should be a focal point of, of, of celebrating that diversity and how it became such an important city for different religions and, and, and again, how it should be used uh, for the positive. So I was, I was lucky to be involved in that. These were beautiful times of, of meeting people of really all the religions of the world and, and seeing what can be done in order to, to again, use the, the separate and mutual wisdom of religions as a source of, of, uh, of powerful, uh, positive uh, 
call to action and, and uh, how good can be done together. That's uh, beautiful. <laughs> it, uh, my, my, and then we will uh, reach exit my <laughs> current station. I so how come suddenly, you yeah. know, from, you know, doing a thing, wonderful things, but in a totally different world, how come you find yourself in this, <laughs> mm. I would say, you know, totally different, we're talking about culture, agriculture, uh, and so for farming and so forth. How come? I mean, it's, a, it's like a, a leap. It seems to me like a total leap from mm. one world to the other. Can, can you it, tell us it about is. that? I, it is, and I learned a beautiful world that represents that uh, serendipity, uh, the, yeah. the power of uh, harnessing uh, coincidences into opportunities yeah. in a proactive way. Uh, one of my recent uh, legal dealings was with a client of mine who is a professor at Tel Aviv University, it's a medical school, and he is a molecular biologist and a neuroscientist, and wow. he phoned me one day, and all these things I've been doing uh, in parallel to my legal life. So I kind of shared my professional life between usually two things at least. And uh, he phoned me and told me about this uh, problem that he randomly came across, the problem of the male chick culling in the chicken industry, yeah. uh, which was new to him, the problem. And I'll speak about the solution soon, but maybe, maybe I'll share a few more words about this problem that I never heard about before this phone call. And Danny, Professor Danny Offen, never heard about uh, before he was uh, shown this uh, video uh, made by one of the animal welfare organizations that wanted to educate the public about this, uh, mm -hmm. this issue of male chick culling. And what is male chick culling? So apparently, for, since human intervention in genetics of livestock, uh, the world of poultry is divided into two separate master breeds, the, which are optimized for two different industries and two different use cases. Uh, you could say of, of chickens. One is you want to eat chickens, those who eat chickens, and you want to eat eggs, those who eat eggs. Uh, apparently there's kind of a trade-off between different uh, traits of chicken that influence what a chicken can be optimized for. So the broiler chicken, which is used for the, for the, for the food industry as, as a source of protein if you eat the chicken, is a fast-growing breed. The trade-off for growing fast is that it lays less eggs. So the female broiler lays much less egg than the layer broiler, which mm -hmm. I'll describe in a moment. Uh, but the size of the chicken and the, the weight of it and the speed that it grows is incomparable to the layer breed. Mm -hmm. So it can reach three and a half, four kilos in 38 days of growth, which is very optimized for the meat industry that cares about bringing uh, as much protein uh, at the shortest uh, uh, cycle. Mm. So uh, then uh, the layer is kind of the opposite. It weighs around 400 grams, so mm. it's like 8x eight, eight uh, the, the broiler size of the, of the layer. Uh, but lays many, many, many more eggs. Mm. So if okay. you are an egg farmer, you would want to grow that breed. Mm. Now let's think about the layers. If you are a female, great. You do your job, you lay chicken, you lay eggs, sorry. But if you are a male, you're useless. So you do not lay eggs, mm. obviously, as a male, but you are not uh, uh, big enough to be of interest to the poultry industry. Poor so male. it's kind of a, yeah. a market failure, I would say, yeah. in a way that was created somehow, that there is a living creature which is not an agricultural product, and because literally there are no free meals, and nobody wants to feed these male chickens, mm. so because okay. you'll end up not being able to sell them for anything, so why would you feed them? Yeah. Therefore, they are identified as males as they hatch from the egg, after like, 21 uh, how days old of incubation. On the, so the process is eggs enter incubators. In, in nature, a mommy would sit on the eggs, and after 21 egg days, <laughs> 21 uh, a days, chick would okay. uh, hatch. 
in modern agriculture, hatcheries do the same, incubators do yeah. the same work of what the body of the mother would do. So they heat the eggs to a certain temperature, which uh, imitates... So it's again the same process, like 21... It's exactly the same okay. process, okay. 21 days, just instead of being in contact with the mother's uh, body temperature, it's, uh, it's uh, in contact with the temperature of the incubator. And there's slight movement, which again imitates the movement and the role of the eggs by, by mother in nature. And after 21 days in such incubators, uh, chicks hatch. Okay. 50% statistically of the chicks would be male and wow. 50% will be chicken, will be female. If you uh, are curious about different professions, so there's a profession called chicken sexers. These Chick are oh, people wow. who This is a new one. They're not, they're, not, they're not psychologists of uh, chickens and about sex or whatever. They are those who determine <laughs> uh, the... sex of the okay. chicken, which is not an easy task to do at volume and at speed. It's a very subtle difference between male and female. Mm. So it is a very skillful profession, mm. but uh, the, re the sad reality is what they do is to decide who is male and female. And the females, of course, would go to the industry to do their job and lay eggs. The world consumes around one and a half trillion eggs every year. And to meet that demand, you need to have around four billion layers laying eggs. But four billion would be male, statistically, because it's 50-50. And those have no uh, active role. So what and is happening with them? Immediately, them? as they hatch and being identified, they are culled in indus industrial terms or killed in uh, layman terms. Oh my God. And, when uh, there are 21 days? When there are zero days. 21 oh, sorry, days okay. of incubation, yeah, yeah. The, chicken hatch, yeah. the chick hatches, yeah, sorry. and One once day, it's yeah. hatched, it's identified as a male or a female. Wow. Females go and serve the industry yeah. and lay eggs. Males Meaning are, after 21 days, they, it's they hatch, they're and identified they, on day zero, and they're immediately killed wow. and disposed of. And, uh, How they're being killed? Hmm, let's that, save that, the that, details, okay, but there okay. are different uh, standards. No, but uh, at least I hope they are not suffering. That's what I'm... Uh, you can't, you can't. Yeah. You the can. sad reality is that you are bringing a creature to life, an animal, uh, an organism, that uh, the only reason it came to life is to be found that it's unnecessary and then you dispose it. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense ethically. It doesn't make sense financially. And it doesn't make sense if you want to think about, I don't know, choose this cup, say you need it to make eight billion of the, four billion, but you actually make eight, and after producing eight, you throw away half. So it just doesn't make sense, uh, not only financially, but sustainability, because there's so many yeah. resources put into bringing them but, to yeah. life. But, but this is what, this is the process in the last 100 years, 200 years, what, what, what this is? This is the process since uh, we don't use the ancient uh, dual-purpose chicken. Once upon a time, uh, farmers who grew chickens in their, in their backyard yeah. would use the chickens to lay eggs. But okay. once genetics became something that can be optimized, uh, by crossbreeding, okay. by the way, this is not high-tech, it's very low-tech, unnatural natural selection. So you realize mm -hmm. that if you crossbreed uh, specific breeds, you manage to optimize for certain okay. traits. And this is a global issue. It's, it's, it's not a global a, issue. It's yeah, a, it's a global okay. issue. It's a global industry. And it's a significant problem that uh, called for Danny's attention once he saw this video. Mm -hmm. Again, he's a neuroscientist and develops on his day job at the University Pharma for Neurodegenerative uh, generative Diseases. Uh, ALS, Alzheimer, etc. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are we are hopefully going to see him soon here. Ah, okay. So yeah, we we Great. already set a date. Uh, Great. Yeah, Great. I was yeah. Great. So thank oh, you sure. for this uh, because this is another initiative of you. They said you have to meet my partner, so yeah. we are going to meet you. Yeah. Right. But uh, what's uh, what's beautiful I found with uh, scientists and Danny specifically that uh, when he he thinks of a problem. Uh, it doesn't leave his mind until mm. until he manages to think of ways to crack it. Uh, okay. Fortunately, he phoned me a few weeks after he found out about the problem, which he was fascinated by in, in a negative way. Like, one, how come I never knew about this? And we as egg consumers don't know that, that, no. uh, that this we is are the paying first time. this yeah. ethical price yeah. Yeah. For, for eating yeah. eggs. But two, it just didn't make sense in a, in a scientific mind way 
Like the information is in the egg as it's laid. It's not that the sex of the chick is being determined through the 21 days of incubation. Mm, okay. Eggs enter incubators with their genetic code already determined. It's okay. either male or female, okay. and the information is there as the egg is laid. Is it different uh, from, for human? Mm, uh, it's a long answer, okay. but in general, no. No. Okay. So uh, the determination is there, the actual embryonic development uh, okay. can vary, but uh, you can ask Danny about that. No, uh, I'm just saying yeah. in a sense that here it's very clear cut that yeah, you yeah. know immediately yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on. Yeah, but okay. I, I can also say as a non-scientist that the human pregnancy uh, is a known uh, at the beginning of the pregnancy, whether the embryo uh, which is developing in the womb is a, is a male mm -hmm. or a female. Um, so... Uh, He phones me one day and said, listen, I came across this problem. Uh, I have an idea how to solve this. Um, the technology transfer office of Tel Aviv University uh, suggested I, I find a way to pursue this. And uh, mm. I was amongst other dealing with, uh, with uh, IP law and intellectual property IP. And he asked me one in general, what do I think about it? Uh, It's the opportunity to share that uh, randomly my grandparents were chicken farmers oh, uh, really? or egg farmers, oh, you know, wow. more specifically. Wow. So, so it's in your vein. Uh. It's in a way in my vein. Uh, <laughs> none of their kids uh, pursued their ki oh. that tradition, although two of their three kids, my mom is the outlier, uh, remained uh, uh, residents of the village, where the, the agricultural ah. village where they were brought up and, and where my late grandparents wow. had their ch uh, egg farm. Where did they come? come from? Your, no, your, your ah, grandparents. They came to Israel from uh, Lithuania and Poland wow. in the 1920s. Wow. Uh, so it's something that probably they brought with them the knowledge or no, no? not at all. No. Not at all. You know, the, the history of these people is that they decided to leave their destiny in, in, in Eastern Europe and, and uh, were trained by Zionist youth movements to wow. become uh, wow. uh, yeah. have some agricultural yeah. skills. And uh, when they got married, they were given a plot of land, a cow and a few chickens, and wow. they were told... Another kind okay, of entrepreneurship. Uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Wow. And uh, so, so I was uh, just fascinated by the story. Again, as a kid, we would uh, spend weekends there, and I would help with collecting the eggs. And I also never heard about it. I mean, wow. they bought the, the female chickens, and I never oh. asked myself, where are the males? Wow. Uh, wow! So you know, until someone sometimes uh, lifts that curtain over wow. your perception, you just don't ask questions, and things are not really wow. apparent to you until until uh, the spotlight is put there. So yeah, I only saw females there laying eggs. I never asked myself where are the males, and probably if I would ask, I would assume that they're going to the the meat industry. I didn't know that they're wow. totally two separate breeds. But anyway, after some exploration. I decided that year that this is, I celebrated 20 years of, of being an active lawyer, and I decided that it's a good point to, to retire from that profession, which I'm reminding you that was never something that I was attracted to as a passion, but I, I was okay, and I found interesting uh, places to, to act as a lawyer. Mm. I wasn't suffering at all. It's not a but message. you weren't feeling that you fulfilling but your... But I felt like doing something completely different. And also one thing I wanted to do is to focus on one thing only. Because mm. I was never fulfilled only as a lawyer. I, I kind of shared my professional life between a few things. And I was a very active father as five kids. I felt that it's time for me to find my new true calling and to hope that it will be one fulfilling thing that would, that would be, enable me to focus mm. on it and on it only. I knew in a way what I was looking for as a checklist of things that it should have a part of, but I didn't know what it's going to be. Uh, I decided to take a year off and go study abroad to create a, a vacuum in my life. Also to pick up uh, a nice Harvard degree and, and <laughs> to meet great people, and it was a, a wonderful experience. But my main motivation was to create that, that space uh, and to detach myself From, from all the things that I was doing the because it's hard. Life, yeah. for, I found it difficult to make a, a very rough maneuver when you're still attached to your yeah. reality. And I was one of the owners of the law firm that I was a partner of. So it's not that I just 
uh, could quit my job and it, it was part of me and many of the things I do I've, I've been part of and not uh, an employee of so luckily I was accepted and I I I took off and I spent the year there during that year besides of again uh, participating in a great program meeting great people from 90 different countries and 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 uh, and sharing our stories and and inspirations from one each other I had the time to think Danny during this year kept on telling me about mm, about this okay. my my firm was continuing to work on the IP of this but uh, the core technology which uh, our company is is using is called CRISPR yeah can you can you elaborate about yeah. that CRISPR yeah, is a very very powerful molecular biology tool uh, the two women uh, who are behind finding out and first publishing uh, this phenomenon uh, were awarded the Nobel Prizes yeah. here in chemistry. Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, this tool, uh, in layman terms, uh, I'll try to explain, enables, so on the foundation of, of humanity and the scientists of, uh, of, uh, of our time managing to map genomes and to create the, in a way that you can, that you can uh, benefit from the map of genomes of organisms, those that were mapped. Uh, that would that was the foundation that enabled then this phenomenon uh, which was found by these two women uh, called CRISPR to to tweak uh, the genetic code of organisms that you have the map of in order to fix things of course if it's used in a in a, in a positive manner so traits my eye color my hair color uh, my body composition, height, all these things are determined by some genetic code, which yeah. is part of my uh, DNA. Yeah. But if the code would be different, I would be different. Mm. And the same for any organism, mm. whether it's a human, an animal, or a plant. Uh, the building blocks of, of what we are uh, biologically are the DNA. And if you can, if you have the power to, to intervene, uh, then possibilities uh, and opportunities open. So some diseases are expressed in the DNA. If you manage to solve that expression, that person uh, or that animal or that plant will not carry that disease anymore. It will not be expressed. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an extremely powerful and we're going to see this uh, the impact all, uh, all over yeah I, um, I, I believe it's the most powerful tool uh, that, yeah. uh, that life sciences has yeah. today I'm told again I'm yeah. not the scientist here <laughs> but uh, you will have the opportunity to discuss it uh, yeah, definitely with, with yeah. uh, Danny and others but what, what I remember back uh, so this phone call was in 2014 I, I was spending this year in, in Boston 2015 uh, CRISPR was first published in 2012 if I recall. Uh, Danny kept on uh, telling me how this is not a evolution but a revolution and how it's changing completely everything he could yeah. any, ever yeah. imagine of being able to do as a molecular biologist. Yeah. For me that was a very strong statement. I kind of got, uh, immersed myself into this reality that I have probably a once in a lifetime opportunity mm. to be involved in a revolution. Yeah. Uh, in a field that I'm not a professional in, so... But you have, you know, strong attachment because of your childhood and your grandparents and... And uh, it made me decide during this year and also during this time there I also took uh, a few courses about entrepreneurship and, and was fascinated by professionally thinking of an idea and making it happen mm -hmm. and there are actually ways to do it and, and strategies and it not, it's not just random. Of course, you need a lot of luck and many other things, but there is a process uh, that one can follow. And two, I was fascinated, you know, I, I was spending a lot of time in, in the Harvard Innovation Lab, which is kind mm, of an accelerator, okay. incubator. Yeah. And you see, you know, I was there when I was 45, but there <laughs> were college kids there that sitting in these glass uh, door offices 
with funny names uh, of companies oh, uh, on the okay. doors and they're creating <laughs> companies you know Facebook uh, was created in that yeah. way uh, yeah. and so like this fascination of seeing actually people taking ideas and making yeah. them happen it uh, was a strong realization for me and I felt that I'm probably uh, on top of finding uh, what I really want to do this idea of taking the idea and making it happen in the real world and And harnessing such a powerful technology to do good in the world uh, um, I really felt that this is probably what I need to do and uh, immediately after coming back to Israel I I, I decided uh, together with Danny that uh, we will change our relationship from client uh, lawyer to co-founders and we set off to to start exit our company wonderful which was created in order to solve the chicken and the egg problem so and can you explain the technology I think I think I think it's so impressing I mean what do you do with CRISPR and I think you also created a device can you yeah yeah so so again uh, back to my to the original story I'm sure Danny was very happy when you came back and says let's do it together <laughs> can ask him but yeah <laughs> you're still together right so, yes, 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 yeah, yes, so yes, it's yes, a good yes. partnership the company yeah. is five years old today <laughs> and we're growing and we're developing more solutions for the livestock industry our mission statement is to to make the livestock industry more sustainable wow uh, and uh, and 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 w- w- with a lot of respect to the emerging world especially from Israel or Israel is a huge hub of innovation around alternative proteins yeah We do believe that the world will still uh, consume uh, uh, proteins from, from, from living creatures uh, mm. until this total shift to alternative proteins. Yeah. And that world of, of, of proteins from livestock should become more sustainable because okay. uh, the planet is paying a heavy price uh, for, for the ways that agriculture is being done tr- in traditional ways. Yeah. To meet the demand and the scale and the growing population and the climate change challenges uh, we need to to solve issues there and it's urgent so sustainability is a big deal and uh, this is one of the areas where sustainability uh, can play a huge role so it's an ethical issue of, of animal welfare but it also has a huge carbon footprint because you're producing 2x and instead of one X yeah. of, uh, of a product that yeah. you only need one X of so and there are also I think financial benefits I think oh of course of course can, can if you, you don't need to produce uh, four billion chickens you save a lot of money for not producing four billion chickens it yeah. costs money to incubate the uh, eggs and the then 21 to days need to, to, yeah. s- to select them and then you need to dispose them yeah. and then you need to find a way to do something with what has been disposed yeah so yeah it's 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 benefits it's you know it's a total win-win situation I mentioned the the human chicken sexers before yeah. they are probably the only ones who are going to lose something out of, of this kind of innovation uh, but they will find hopefully another profession so so we're <laughs> okay. not too worried about that um, can you tell it can you talk about the process and the technology yeah. I mean the device you created right. I think it's unique I think it's I think our listeners probably going to enjoy it very much mm. so uh, back to the problem so What, what caught Danny's attention that the information is in the egg. So there is either a female inside or a male inside, and the DNA is different. Now, in Danny's eyes, if we only knew to extract that information and analyze it, the so- problem would be solved because nobody would go and incubate a, fem- an, a male egg knowing it's a male egg. The thing is, you don't know. You assume 50% are females, as, but it will take me 21 days to find out, and that's how it works today. So how do you find out? So the easy way is you take out material and today in the age of uh, unfortunate age of, of being exposed to Corona and PCR, everyone understands the terminology of PCR. But back yeah. in the day when Danny told me about PCR, I knew nothing about it. <laughs> but uh, if you make a hole in the egg and extract a genetic material out of mm. the egg and put it into a PCR and do a PCR analysis, you know what, what's mm. the composition of the DNA. And amongst other, which chromosomes are there? Is it male okay. or female? Okay. So the information is definitely there. Okay. But we realize that that's not a good idea because you don't want to mess around with the eggs. One, mm. it's, it's not an elegant approach. The industry would not like it and it's not cost effective. 
and it has the potential of damaging the eggs because this eggshell is quite a unique uh, structure and phenomenon in nature mm -hmm. and it has this power being in a way very soft so you can easily break it those of us yeah. who eat eggs know how easy it is <laughs> but how strong it is that unless you really want to break it it doesn't yeah. break yeah. it only cracks when yeah. the chick wants to yeah. want to hatch wants to hatch so if you damage that egg even with a micro tiny hole it has an effect on the fertility rates etc so we mm. realized that that's not an idea but then then he said how can i see the dna mm. that was like what was wow. driving him and then he he actually thought just a second it's not something unknown in molecular biology that you can tag cells in order to follow them in lab setups in order to understand their physiology or whatever they're doing so the concept of tagging cells and biomarkering them it's called is there uh, by the way i think this is one of the definitions of of uh, of good innovation you don't need to invent something you need to import Put, yeah. things assemble. from different places and bring them into a new use case and yeah. to solve a new problem yeah and 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 uh, without undermining danny's great innovation here it was not inventing something that was not existing before it was importing concepts and applying them to solve a new problem that he was facing it's a kind of genius in any case <laughs> um, different one so uh, so then then he said okay there is a way to make chromosomes apparent that's by mm. changing their their optical appearance by bio tagging mm. them and then without going too much into details yeah. there is a way to create that bio tagging in a binary way so the tagging mm. will happen only on males and therefore we can create a binary situation which is a clear determination if you are male your chromosomes will be bio tagged if you are female your chromosomes will be untouched mm. which is also perfect because you know it's a new field of of uh, intervention in genetics and you rather not bring products to market which have been through uh, changes because mm. some unrealistic fears but some safety uh, precautions that you know when you mess with dna th there is things that there you need might to be, be yeah, aware energy. of and and therefore the ability to create this determination in a way that the mm -hmm. female remains exactly the same untouched the dna of the female which is an exit uh, yeah. technology outcome female yeah. is exactly the same as the female that my mm, late grandparents okay, were important. raising in their farms okay what is affected is the males because they are biotagged so what's happening with them then? so then uh, we needed to create a device that can pick up this optical information okay. which is inside the egg okay so one step back we are able today because of the science of uh, of CRISPR to create a genetic lines uh, which is a trait of the of the animal which uh, is carried from generation to generation and that trait is that if you're male, you carry a fluorescent biomarker. Hmm. This fluorescent biomarker, with the right device that we developed, can be seen through the eggshell as the egg is laid. So eggs are now laid, yeah. 100 eggs are laid, 50 would be male, 50 yeah. would be female. After our intervention in the genetics, the females look exactly the same, but the males carry this biomarker. We run all the eggs under a scanner, which scans and looks for that biomarker or that fluorescent effect. The females do not carry that, so they are allowed wow. into the incubator. The, this device uh, at the entry point of the hatchery d uh, acts as a gatekeeper. So instead of those human sexers that I explained to you about before, we now have a robot Instead of looking for wow. chicks, if they're male or female, it looks at eggs, which are undeveloped mm. embryos at day zero, meaning there's nothing there yet. It's a, it's a sperm and the ovary, but the, the embryonic development has not yet begun. The DNA is there. It is biotagged, and the male is identified as such, and the machine pushes it away and does not allow it into the incubator so if what, I'm, yes. what creates a reality of female only incubation right. wow. Uh, wow. environments so you know that if it entered the incubator it was untagged therefore identical to a female we know today 
And you don't need to select them at the output side because if it entered the incubator, it's female, and therefore everything hatching is female, a uh, problem solved. So meaning every year you can save like four billion lives every, every year for uh, at the volume of the industry yeah. today and it's growing yeah. and it's projected to okay. double itself by 2050 well, because okay. of the amount of protein consumed mm. and people kind of moving down mm. to more a uh, healthier and sustainable mm. proteins and egg is is, is, is one, one of, of those yeah uh, so there's the, the the consumption of eggs is growing per capita okay. anyway and uh, the planet uh, population is of growing, course. as we know. So all by all, now the numbers are around 4 okay. billion a year, but they would they they, would, they yeah, would It's grow. going to increase. And what about uh, financial uh, savings? How, how I so think it's also billions. This technology all yep. by all has the potential of saving billions of dollars okay. uh, from all kinds of aspects. Okay. And again, we are harnessing this same technology. And once we became a company which is familiar with the genetics of poultry, we are asking ourselves, okay, what else we can do to create a yeah. sustainable future for the livestock industry? One of the m huge pain points of livestock, like any other organism, is health. Yeah. And and the uh, ability to be affected by, by disease and virus. And again, we're sitting here today yeah. when we are facing a new wave of, of the COVID. Yeah, and, Delta. And, yeah, same with animals so and we know also that that viruses move from from animals to humans also mm. the source of this uh, virus allegedly comes from an animal so if you can solve the health issues of of livestock for them not to be affected by viruses first of all it solves a huge issue of sustainability within the livestock industry, but also has a huge effect on human health and the potential wow. of viruses okay. moving from there. So now we're busy developing our second product, which is genetic resistance to avian influenza, hmm. which is a huge, huge, huge pain point in the poultry industry. Yeah, I millions, thought, you thought you talked about it like a few days ago, or a week ago or so. Yeah, I saw millions of millions of of. of chickens are affected by 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 it's like the corona of chickens yeah. uh, of uh, avian influenza and different speaking of corona with us human if we're affected we're quarantined for 14 days or whatever wow. number of days in the chicken world you don't take those risks and if you are a, in a flock or in the neighborhood of a flock which the virus would be found all the chickens wow. will be killed wow. in order to make sure that the the pandemic will not spread you die uh, unfortunately we have to finish but i was wondering if people want to hear more about you about the company they want to contact you directly whatever how can they do that because i think i'm sure that people around that are going to say wow this is interesting this is very good for my country my my community might be my firm or my farmer my farm how can they reach you where, where, where? Yeah, sure. One, uh, Yehuda El Ram is my name, and I can be found online on <laughs> social networks. Uh, He's not hiding, fortunately for us. Our company is called Exit, egg like the egg, XY like the sex chromosomes, and T, so exit.com. So... Uh, okay. Will will you be will be will you be willing to share and send us some information so we can tag it when we send sure. it uh, beyond Israel's uh, you know borders? Uh, we be delighted. So definitely, definitely. Wonderful. We, and we love to be in touch and and to share and to be inspired by what others are doing and and that's the beauty of science, by the way, that it's an open platform which wants to share itself with the world. Of course, you also need to take the into account uh, commercial uh, considerations if you want to be able to develop science because uh, last question before we go if we are sitting here and the year is uh, 2035 or so where do you expect uh, your company to be uh, what are, what are your wishes for your company 2035 that is uh, yeah it's a long view 14 years <laughs> from now okay yeah uh, not that long but yeah a little yeah, bit uh, we believe that uh, we will be a company where most of our innovation will be in the space of animal health. That's where, the, okay. besides this unique uh, problem of sexing, which we happily and randomly found out, uh, once we strategically uh, immersed ourselves into, into this world, the effect of the ability to improve genetics 
uh, for sustainability lies in the space of animal health okay. and we would uh, be dealing with solving more diseases for more species thank you it was a great discussion thank you for coming and being with us and uh, we're looking forward to hear if when with there, there are new things I think we'll be more than happy to share it with the world if it if it will be possible thank you very much uh, for uh, interviewing me in such a beautiful way and thank, thank you. you all for listening <laughs> thank you so and th again I want to thank you Dan and I want to thank Lior which is assisting us and we're looking forward to meeting you again have a beautiful day